Let's hone in on one of your big stories this morning. The focus today is on Senecal as the economic freedom fighters and AFRI Forum are set to square off in the small free state town. Now, the EFF says it's marching to protect democracy, while for AFRI Forum, it's about pushing back against farm murders. Now, as fears mount over the possibility of a confrontation, the South African Institute of Race Relations says the country does not need violence, petty blame games, extremism and animosity to divide our communities. The think tank is set to launch its community safety charter this morning, aimed at building a common purpose for all South Africans. The Institute says the time is now for uh, honest, open and reasonable discussions about the key challenges facing our country. Let's unpack it all now. We're joined by the Deputy Head of Policy Research at the IRR, that's Herman Pretorius. Herman, good morning. Thanks again for your time on the AM report. Before we delve into uh, the document itself, the charter itself. I want to just begin by setting up the sort of um, the background for our viewers and, and ask you, what do you think makes the Institute of Race Relations the best place to deal with this situation that's possibly unfolding in Senegal this morning? Well, I think... Um what we anticipate to see today and what we have seen over recent weeks in Senegal is really a confluence of four key issues that the Institute of Race Relations for its 90 years of existence um, have really uh, been intensely involved in. Uh, the first one, I think, of course, is race relations themselves. I think any South African would be clearly aware of the race undertones in many of the fears and discussions and accusations in, uh, in, 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 with regards to this issue here in Senegal. Uh, so we really want to uh, make the point that as an organization that has dedicated its entire existence to understanding race relations and understanding South African attitudes on race relations and our data consistently showing that South Africans are decent, moderate people from all racial backgrounds. I think that is an important voice to be heard today. Then, of course, the rule of law that can never be undermined and, um, and, and that really should deserve some defending um, in the public debate. The failures, then, of a government that is both too powerful yet too incompetent to ensure the safety of South Africans, whether that's in Soweto, Senegal, or Mitchell's Plain. And then finally, I think, an element that really is close to the hearts of the Institute of Race Relations is the issue of property rights and property rights um, and property owners becoming uh, often the subject of some vilification by some political rhetoric. So the Institute this morning, Herman, is launching uh, a community safety charter, uh, the purpose here to build a common purpose for South Africans according to the information that we have. So how do we talk about a common purpose in a country like South Africa, the most unequal in the world, where that inequality is marked along racial lines? Yes, I, I think that that is the first thing that we should do. Is we should be honest about the situation facing our country. And that is exactly why I think uh, the point about you know, petty blame games is an important one to make. It is very, very easy to point fingers at people who are uh, from different communities, from different backgrounds. But if you really look at the data, and not just look at the data, but speak to people, you understand that whether it's in the township, whether it's in the flats, whether it's in the agricultural areas of this country, there is a grave disappointment in how the government has increasingly failed through the South African police services to hold South Africans safe and to protect them against uh, the scourge of crime that our country really um, is, is tragically known for. So when it comes to building common purpose and common ground, the aim is really to say that this plan, whether it's the Reto Cynical or Mitchell's plan, offers an opportunity for South Africans to really take a measure of control in the management of their own community safeties uh, where government has failed. And I think that's why our first point of the charter is so 
uh, important and, and perhaps a bit of a challenge and a bit of a change that people aren't used to. That first point being giving the communities the power to elect police station commanders, to build into the police service a manner of accountability, whether it's in Senecal, whether it's in Mitchell's claim. And I think that can be the start of a common ground discussion on accountability in policing. So that's, that's one of the issues here that the Charter proposes, what you've just outlined there, giving communities the power to elect station commanders. Uh, it also talks about making all police and prosecutorial appointments on merit, holding independent investigations and public hearings into criminality. How much of uh, this Charter has the backing from government? Because it sounds like it will need it. It will most definitely need it. You know, the, 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 if there's one thing that the Institute has learned from South African history and our 90 years involvement in it, it is that the South African people can be counted on much more than government can, and that government often is forced to follow the people's lead on important issues. I think it's important to note historically that it was a groundswell over many decades from ordinary South Africans that truly forced the national party government's hand into negotiations, even with the matter of, you know, for example, the 1992 referendum. There's a very clear indication there that South Africans led and the government followed. So I, I think that is a fair way of looking at it, that the Institute isn't a party uh, running for political office. There's this wonderful quote, before you win the election, you must win the argument. And that's what we're trying to do here, to convince South Africans that they have the power to lead and the power to make government follow. So when we start convincing people to build common ground, government is definitely a role player, but not the first role player. So citizens are much more powerful than I think they themselves sometimes realize. Okay, so, uh, you know, Herman, the question then is, it's, it's a charter that is for now on paper, what happens now? It sounds like it's going to be a massive job of taking this charter to the ground, on the ground, to every single community around the country. How do you get buy-in then? Yes, I think, I think you are right. It, is, it isn't a small task. And, um, but the thing is that we, I have immense faith in the people of South Africa um, from all backgrounds, from all communities. You know, 83% of South Africans say they don't care what the skin color of their teacher, of their child's teacher is, as long as a child is good. If you can trust, uh, as long as a teacher is good, if you can trust another person, another race in this country with your child's future, then I think there's so much common ground to be had. That is what makes me encourage that we can come to Senegal and launch this charter, that we can take it to the Cape Flats where gang violence has decimated communities due to political decisions made in the 50s and the 60s. And we can take that to township communities where mob justice is almost the only form of justice those communities know because they can no longer trust the police. Mm. It is a massive job. Um, and it's not one that, you know, we undertake with any expectation of quick success. But it, it is a job to be undertaken because I think for too long, South Africans have not been engaged in solution-based thinking and perhaps for too long been willing to listen to politicians who shift blame rather than build futures. I, I suppose my question then, Herman, you talk about, you know, 80% of South Africans are not concerned about the race of a child's teacher, for example, as long as the, the skills of that teacher is the important thing. So what about that 20% of our country for whom race is a determining factor in how they engage with fellow South Africans? I think you will always have you know, a section of your population that is, let's say, ideologically charged at both ends of the spectrum. And I, I think that the fear is, and that's part of why the Institute decided to come to Senegal today, um, is to make sure that there, this isn't something that, uh, you know, deteriorates into a battle of extreme voices. In Afrikaans, we have the saying uh, of Leah Blicker uh, and Haras, you know, the, the empty tins make the most noise. And I think South Africans of the moderate middle um, have been listening to that 20% long enough 
that the 80% of South Africans who truly want a multiracial, successful South Africa can making can start making uh, their voices heard. So yes, we have 20% of this country that um, might be, uh, you know, uh, racially inclined in one way or another. But I think that uh, with our history, it shows that even these minds can be changed. And I must say, if I can go out in, on a mission and someone says to me, you know, 80% of people will agree with you, but 20% won't, then I will tell them, it's perhaps not ideal, but I like the odds. Hadman Pretorius, thank you for your time this morning on the AM report. I think just scraping the surface there of what is an incredibly complicated issue here in our country. And of course, this is as we continue to track the story that's set to unfold in Sienakal, or rather set to continue in Sienakal.